you know, asked about our church. I believe our church is on the brink. We're just, we're just about to explode. I believe God's going to bless us. We've got the people here. We've got the workers here. And we're ready for God to bless us. You know, just like the first church that said that they increased daily, that God blessed them. I believe God's going to start blessing us. He's already blessed us enough, ain't he? Amen. And we just need to start sharing them blessings with other people. Yeah. But today, I'm going to preach loud. i got to preach hard because we got the Lord's Supper. And it's amazing how God works. See, I told y'all last week, look for the little things that God does. Now, uh, as I told y'all the story last week of how something happened between my, uh, my sermon or whatever, my brother Terry had text the same chapter that I was preaching out of. It was just crazy how that happened. And Daddy wants to request a song that we sang for him last week. And then, uh, of course, this morning, when we do the Lord's Supper, the verse that I'm using is the verse that I'm using in my sermon this morning. It's just, it's just crazy how God works and puts things together. The title of my message, which I didn't give Brother Chris this morning, is What's Our Purpose? So we talked about discipleship a few weeks ago. Last week we talked about being available for God, being more available. So now we've got to find out what's our purpose. That's a question many people ask. What is my purpose here on earth? And a lot of times when you're down and out, when you're not feeling confident or happy in yourself, you're trying to lose your purpose, you lose who you are or what God wants you to be. But the first question that you must ask, what is my purpose, you must ask, am I saved? That's the main question you need to ask yourself. Am I saved? Have I been saved by Jesus Christ? Amen. And that's the main question. That's the most important question you can ever ask yourself. And that's the most important question you can ask somebody else. Are you saved? I remember when I was at M Farm, I just started there, and they had this uh, irrigation system put in, and uh, that guy, I had no clue what I was doing. They made me the maintenance man. I had no idea like any of this stuff going on. I was 20 years old. And I jumped in the vehicle with this guy, and he was driving me around the parking lot to look at you know, the irrigation system and stuff and kind of telling me about it. He just come out and asked me, he said, are you saved, son? I said, yes, sir, I'm saved. I'm saved at nine years old. But it's amazing how somebody just asked you that question. You feel the Holy Spirit when they ask. Amen. Sometimes just asking that question, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? So once you get past the am I saved, and I hope that you are, and if you ain't today, can be the day to be saved. Because Jesus come down here and died for our sins, you can be washed in the blood today, and you can go live eternally in heaven. But the decision not to follow Jesus, the decision not to be saved today, is a decision that you're ready to go to hell. That's honest. I'm just being honest with you today. Heaven or hell, there's two choices, and you make the choice. I can't make the choice for you. You have to do it, and I hope that you do it this morning. If you don't know Jesus, today can be the day that you know Jesus. But we got to look for what's our purpose. Now, God has revealed to me and Daddy what our purpose is, what He wants us to do. But every day, there's different things. we still got to follow Him. You know, He's called us to preach, but He teaches us and, and guides us in different ways. Now, many of you may ask, what's, what's my purpose, God? A lot of people have low self-esteem. They don't have confidence in themselves. And see, when you're a Christian, you should be fully confident. You should be fully happy because Jesus lives within you. So you've got to get rid of, of your size, your age, your look. Don't worry about none of that. Don't worry about what people think about you. When we uh, read in Psalms 139 this morning, uh, the psalmist David was talking about having value in yourself. And God, before you even, uh, your mother even knew you was in her womb, that he loves you. He loves all of us. So we have purpose and we have worth. God loves us. Now, once you get saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit guides us. Right. Now, when you get saved, you've got to start building a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, when you get married, obviously, you've already built a pretty close relationship to get married in the first place. But after you get married, the relationship just don't stop, stop there. You continue to grow. And if you don't continue to grow, what happens? You're a statistic. One out of two marriages get divorced. Why? Because they don't trust each other. They Something happens. They're pushing other things before their spouse. And they don't have a relationship. A Christian is the same way. When you get saved, if you don't start building a relationship with Jesus, you're not going to advance in your life, in your walk, or anything. Now, you don't have to be saved to be successful in life. You can be saved and not live for Jesus and still have money and still have good things happen to you. What I'm saying is you're not going to please God by not living for Him. You're probably going to be very miserable. A lot of people, we look at their success based on their job title, where they're at in life, the car that they drive, the house that they live in. But let me tell you right now, none of those things bring true happiness. None of those things fill the empty void. So if you're a Christian and you may have all those things, you can keep chasing after bigger and better, but until you start building a relationship with God, you're not going to be truly happy. You're not going to have that empty void that's within you. And only God can fill that void when you start building the relationship. And how do 
you build the relationship, we got to a good start already. We're here at church. We're already singing and praising. We already ate some good food earlier. We already come to Sunday school. You put church first. You put God first. You make sure that you dedicate your time and your life. You come to church. Because without church, there is going to be that emptiness. You're missing out on fellowship. Jesus died for the church. It's important to be in church. I've heard many people say they were trying to justify them not coming to church by saying, well, where two are gathered, Jesus is in the midst. Where two are gathered in his name. There's a lot of times we're gathered in places. You think Jesus is in the midst of the bar? When you're not gathered in his name, so you can be gathered anywhere. But we need to be gathered in his church. Amen. I've seen people, you can get saved anywhere. You can get saved at Walmart. You can get saved at restaurants. But you know what? I've never seen people get saved at Walmart or restaurants. But I've seen people get saved right here at the altar. Amen. You can change your life at home. But I've seen lives being changed here at the altar. It's just something about coming to God's house. So to find your purpose, first off, you've got to be dedicated and be involved in church. You see, sin separates us from heaven. So that's why it's important that you get saved because... Our sin. It says the wages of sin is death. So we all have a sin nature. There's nobody in here who hasn't sinned. We all have sinned. Jesus died for those sins. And when you get saved, you try to stop doing sin. Now we're still going to sin after salvation. But a lot of people, you're going to stop that willfully sinning all the time. Where you just go and do it and you don't have a conscience about it. If you don't have a conscience about your sin, that's when you've got to reevaluate your Christianity. It's like, am I really saved? Because if you're sinning and you're saved, you're going to feel bad about it. Amen. You're going to try to seek forgiveness for it. But that's why if you look at John 6, 40, what is the will of God? And when you look for the will of God, it's going to say for all men to be saved. That is the main thing. As I asked you a second ago, are you saved? If you answered yes, you've already fulfilled part of God's will. He wants everybody who's ever lived, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what sin you've committed, no matter what situation you're at in now, He wants you to be saved. That's the main thing. So what's the main thing for Christians to do once we get saved? To carry out God's will is our job to go out into the world. What did it say? Uh, Jesus tells His disciples, go out and baptize in my name to all the nations. So it's our job as Christians to spread the word of God. And if we ain't doing that, then we ain't fulfilling the purpose that God has for us. We ain't doing what He has asked us to do if we're not spreading the word. What's the use of a Christian that don't go to church? Answer that question. Is there? What's the use of a Christian that's not going out and witnessing and testifying and praising God? He called us for a purpose. He's called us for a reason. When you get saved, you have a job, and that's to go out and spread Jesus' name. You don't have to be a preacher. He says we all are supposed to go out and preach and teach and tell about Jesus. That's our job. That's what we got to do. So the first will of God is for all men to be saved. But that still don't answer the question, Brother Zach, to what is my purpose? Well, we're going to try to get to that. I can't answer that to you, but I hopefully can give you some steps to try to find that in your life. If you turn to Romans 12, 1, 2, and 3, and that's part of our uh, Lord's Supper verses that we use, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable uh, unto God, which is your reasonable service. So what, what, what does that word therefore mean? The word therefore, when it says right here, I beseech you therefore, it's talking, Paul's talking about before uh, Romans 1 through 11. So we're in Romans 12, he's kind of talking about the things that's happened before. He's talking about the sins. So now he's talking about right now that we got to sacrifice our bodies, a living sacrifice. Well, our bodies are sinful bodies, ain't they, Brother Jeff? They are sinful bodies. That's why when you die, the spirit goes to heaven, the body goes in the grave. And one day when he comes back, both of us are going to be in the air. And we'll yeah. Yeah. That's it right there. He said, no graves are going to bust out. And we were talking about this morning, making a joke when Brother Terry was talking, there's going to be somebody who thinks they're saved standing by the graveyard. It said, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we will be met up with him in the twinkle of eyes. There's going to be a lot of people, they're going to see the graves bust open. They're going to be like, all right, Jesus, I'm ready. Well, wait a minute. Why didn't I go to heaven? Well, you know what? Because you never was saved in the first place. Right, that's so right. you've got to make sure. You've got to know for sure. You can't be 99.9% .9 sure because if you're 99.9% .9 sure of your salvation, you're most likely 100% lost. You've got to know 110% that you are saved today. You don't want to take no chances when death comes knocking at your door. You don't want to take a chance when Jesus comes back. So we're going to meet him one or two ways. We're either going to meet him in the air before we die, or we're going to go to the grave and we're going to meet him. So you're going to meet Jesus one way or the other. So it makes sure that you're saved and that you're living for him. It's a simple formula. 
And why is it so hard for us Christians to live for God? Why is it so hard to come four hours a week to church? Why is it so hard to come over here and do these extra events? Why is it so hard to get up at 8 o'clock and make it over here to a breakfast at 9 when, the, when Monday morning we're going to make it to work at 8? You thought about that? We up already ready at 6 30, getting ready, putting on our makeup, fixing our hair, getting in the shower, getting our kids to preschool, and we can barely make it to church on Sunday school. Well, brother Zach, it's just too much going on. There's not too much going on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. When you get up to school and you get to work, we got to put God first. We got to get right. We got to sacrifice to God. It says present your body to God. So what does that mean? When you, when you sacrifice your body to God, it's saying He's going to use your body as a channel uh, to which His righteousness of God is manifested. So He uses us to do His work. You are a vessel. We're a vessel for God. But a lot of people as Christians, they're being a vessel for Satan. They're doing His work. They're doing Satan's work. We have got to be a sacrifice of God. we got to get out of the way. The Bible says that we must decrease. So what? He can what? Increase. Amen. We must decrease. He must increase. Brother Terry said, I love his testimony, and it stuck with me for many years. Right when he was being called, uh, coming in to be a deacon, he said, I need more of Jesus, and I need a whole lot less of me. Amen. That's what we got to have that mindset. I need more of you, Jesus. I need less of me. Jesus, I'm dedicating my body as a sacrifice to you, and when you do, it's holy. It's acceptable unto God. Look at verse 2. It says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be not conformed to the world. Look at the Christian today. Look at Christianity today. They are conforming. They ain't transforming. I want to be a transformed Christian. I don't want to conform back to the old way. Too many Christians today, they are conforming to the world because they're not involved in church. They're not involved in giving it all to Jesus. We have let this society warp our minds. Society has backed Christians up in a corner and they're putting so much pressure on us that they don't want us speaking out about abortions. They don't want us speaking out about marriages only between a man and a woman. They don't want us to speak out that a man shouldn't be in a woman's restroom. They want us to be silent so we feel bad about even mentioning these things. Now, we have got to stand up and be bold for God. It says be not conformed to this world because they're trying to conform Christianity. The Bible is the same since it got wrote. Since the authors took the pen and put it on the paper, it's not changed and it will not change. We have got to stand strong by it because the world is pushing on us every single day. I seen something in Chicago the other day. It said a man went and he molested three teenage girls. And when he got arrested, he said, officers, I identify as a nine-year-old boy. I got a nine-year-old boy trapped in a man's body. This is where we've got to. We've gotten so far away from God that we can just identify as anything. But if you identify as a Christian, they want to crucify you. They want to put you up there and put you on the cross because you stand by the word. We are separated. we got to stay separated from the world because the world hates us. Jesus said, if they hate you, just know they hate me first. You know how we know we hated him? They put him on the cross and they killed him because they don't want to follow Jesus. But it's our job today, you know what? To love the ones that want to persecute us. Jesus said don't just love your neighbor. Don't just love your brothers and your sisters, but love your enemies. So today, the world has made an enemy to Christianity, but you know what? We still got to love them. But yeah. in our love, you've got to stand bold and you've got to stand on what the Bible teaches and there is no wavering in our faith. We stand strong on this. But the best friend you'll ever have is one that will tell you the truth. Ain't that right? That's right. How many times are we guilty because we don't want to offend somebody that we will just agree or we'll just encourage the maybe the sinful activity or the things that they're doing wrong? A good friend is somebody that will tell you you are doing wrong. It says that iron sharpens iron, don't it, Brother Terry? So we're supposed to confess our faults to one another. So when somebody confesses your fault, don't act like it's not a fault. You've got to be brave and bold and stand by Jesus and lead them to the way. So many people, they are fake to your face, but they'll stab you in the back. We've got to be honest. And a lot of times, honesty is not like people don't like honesty. They want you to lie. They want you to, to conform to the world. But we need to be transformed, and we need to be honest. And the best friend you'll ever have is one that will be honest with you. Jesus is honest with us. So we've got to stand bold by the word, don't we, Brother Jeff? We've got to stand. That's what I love about house of worship. We're not going to waver in our faith. They can come knocking on the doors in a few years. I'm telling you, within 20 years, when Jimmy's about my age, when he gets on up there in his late 20s and early 30s, times are going to change so much. Just look how much time has changed in the last 10 years. 
we are getting so far away from God. It is end times. Jesus is coming back Amen. soon. He's on His way back. There's so much going on in the world right now. If you haven't opened up your eyes and seen it, you need to turn on the news just for five minutes and you will see that Jesus is knocking on the doorstep. So it's our job to make sure that we are living right for Him and finding out what our purpose is. Because I don't want to go to heaven and stand before Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the one who died for me, and say, I never did do nothing for you, God. When I come to church, I didn't want to listen. I didn't want to pay attention. I didn't care what the preacher said. But you know what? Oh, I'm in heaven now. Just go ahead and give me free reigns to everything. It's important that today that we start living for Him before we die. Don't go to your grave or regret what you didn't do while you was alive. Amen. So our, today, do not be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The only way to be renewed is Jesus Christ. He said, I make all things new. Amen. Then it says in verse 3, For I say through the grace given to me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Woo! Ain't that, that just hits on it, Daddy. A pastor should not be ashamed to go in there and clean the toilet. A pastor should think, well, I'm above this position. I'm up here. Y'all are down here. Y'all go clean the toilet. No, we are not to think too highly of ourselves because we're all equal when we stand before God. When we stand before the living God, we are all equal. He's perfect and we are nothing. We are nothing. So don't right. think of yourself to be too good to do something else. Right. Jesus said, be a servant. Jesus went and washed the disciples' feet. And they're saying, what are you doing, Jesus? Why are you washing my feet? He's giving an example of how we're supposed to serve other people right. and do stuff that people don't want to do. So next time you feel lazy, you think so-and-so needs to do that, that you're too good to do it, then you're just living in sin. The Bible tells us don't think too good of yourself, and you go over there and do it. And when you do, guess what happens? He starts blessing you. Things will start happening in your life. You'll start Amen. doing what you don't do and start doing it for God. So don't think too highly of yourself. Ephesians 5, 17 through 20. It says, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So we can understand what God's will is for us. But we don't need to be unwise. We have to be focused on the Word of God. If you're not in the Word of God reading it, how can you ever know what God wants you to do? Amen. How can you ever know how to live? How can you know how to get through situations and get through storms? going to take it from me, just a 29-year-old man, don't have to get in the Word yourself and you will find out for yourself what God wants you to do. He will speak to you. He will, he will tell you how to go and how to be and you will find out what God's will is for you when you start living for Him. And it says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. He's saying stay away from the drinking, but you know what? Be good with the Spirit. I think he uses that example there because he knows when you drink that you're in a different state of mind. And that he gives an example here, be, except, be in excess with the Spirit, because the Spirit can give you a different set of mind. He can uplift you. You've never felt nothing like it when you get filled up with the Spirit, when you let the Spirit Amen. guide and control you. Right. What does it say? Be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean to be filled with the Spirit? Well, when you get saved, you receive the Spirit, but there's many Christians walking around the day. They're on E. They ain't full. Their gas tank is on empty. If you don't come to church, if you don't dedicate time to God, if you don't pray, if you're not living for Him, you are not being filled with the Spirit. So today, you've got to look at yourself. Paul said, examine your heart. See what you're doing wrong. See, we've got to be uh, humble, and we've got to be honest with ourselves. Just the way we look at somebody else and judge their life, we've got to look at our own life that way. We're so easy to pick out somebody else's fault, but we're so easy not to look at our own faults. We've got to look at ourselves. We've got to look within. God, tell me where I'm going wrong. Reveal it to me, Lord, so I can be filled with the Spirit. When you're filled with the Spirit, you're not ashamed to stand up here and sing. You're not ashamed to raise your hand up there. Somebody, well, what's the brother over there doing? Raise it up his hand. This is a Baptist church. This is God's church. Amen. Amen. We just got Baptist on the sign out there. We should not be ashamed to praise and to sing and to worship our Lord and Savior. Yes. Because one day we're going to do it in heaven. So why are we ashamed down here? Yes. We don't need to be ashamed. We need to get back on fire for God and be filled with the Spirit. So how do you be filled with the Spirit? Verse 19 will tell us. It says, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Amen. 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 When you start singing to God, when you start singing them hymns to God, when you start singing them spiritual songs to God, when you make a melody in your heart during the week, if you're listening to the rap songs, if you're listening to them old country songs, if you're listening to all this stuff talking about drinking, talking about sex, talking about partying, all this stuff, you're going to have, you're going to be filled with the Spirit. No, you're not. 
Start listening to music that relates and uh, honors God. Start listening to stuff that lifts you up and, and honors the good Lord. Everything that we do, do should bring honor to our Heavenly Father. Everything that we do. And when you start going down the list of things that we don't, that we need to get rid of, start clearing it out of your life. Everything that we do, it says, if you want to be filled with spirit, start singing hymns and be singing praises. And when you do that, it says in verse 20, give thanks always for uh, all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's saying give thanks in everything. Now when you read the Bible, it says that it rains on the just and the unjust. So the just is the Christians. The unjust is the law. So it's saying it's going to rain. Now what does it mean when you say it's going to rain? Things are going to happen in your life whether you're saved or not. Sicknesses are going to happen in your life whether you are saved or not. Things are going to happen. So God says give thanks in the all things. So a Christian, when it starts coming to storm, when the tornado starts coming, see sometimes when everything's going good, we can't see too clearly. You're going to have to get my analogy here. When the storm comes, the rain comes down, usually when you're driving, you can't see good. But see, in a Christian life, when the storm comes and the rains come, that's when you start seeing a little bit better because God has humbled you a little bit, and now you're seeking Him more than you was back when everything's going good. So if everything's going good right now, let me tell you, the storm can come, and they will go. But always be prepared. Always be ready. A, a Christian that's not ready for the storm coming in their life is going to be subject to being blown over in that storm. But a Christian that is prepared, a Christian that is filled with the Holy Spirit. A Christian that is singing melodies and singing spiritual songs in their heart when the storm comes, you're going to withstand the, the, of the storm. It's going to make you better. It's going to make you stronger when you get out of it. So give thanks to God and everything. Right now, somebody, you're dealing with some health issues. Give thanks to Jesus. It's hard to thank Jesus when my back hurts. It's hard to thank Jesus when I got my arm wrapped up. It's hard to thank Jesus when my finances and my $400 electric bill just come in. It's hard to thank Jesus for that. God says give thanks in all things. You know why? Because this is a temporary home. My home's up in heaven. My address ain't 377 Red Oak Circle. My address is heaven. Them streets ago. That clear street. That beautiful street. That mansion that he's got to be ready for. That's what I'm giving thanks for. We've got to be prepared. We've got to be ready. Give thanks to God for all Amen. things. Be filled Amen. with the Spirit and be ready and be prepared. Amen. God is good, eh? Amen. God is good, <laughs> Amen. We need to be in prayer all the time. Prayer. Yeah. Prayer. When you build that relationship with God, you're going to be praying the Lord you've ever prayed. Yeah. You're going to be talking to Him and having conversations with Him. When you say it's a one-sided conversation, it ain't a one-sided conversation. I'm telling you, when you truly pray to God, as you pray, you feel Him there. You feel Him. He's actually guiding your words as you pray. He said, I already know your heart. I just want to hear you. Just give it to me. Just lay your burdens down. But sometimes I believe Christian, this is something I've dealt with, is when you stand up and you pray to God, lead me, guide me, direct me, He's going to do it. But sometimes people are scared to do that because they know that He's going to do it. They know that they're going to have to start cutting the fat out of their life. They're going to have to start cutting the bad things out of their life. Because when you say a prayer to God, God, please do this in my life, He's going to do it, but you better be ready to do it. You better not back out on what you told him to do. You know why? Because that's when a big storm is going to come in your life. That's when something really is going to knock you down. Because when you tell God, I want to be filled with the Spirit. God, I want to just give everything to you. See, it says the, the Holy Spirit controls us. It, 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 we need to let it give control and let us take less control. We need to let the Spirit guide and direct us. It's a GPS and it pushes us and it teaches us and it comforts us. We have got to just let go and let in. And then it will guide us and direct us. But when you pray that prayer, be ready for something great to happen in your life. But you better be prepared and you better honor and you better not lie to God. Don't play games with God. Do right. not play games with God. You can play games with people. You can play games at your work. But don't play games with God. So today, if you're ready, if you're seriously ready for God to make a, a big movement in your life, what are you willing to let go of? What are you willing to do? Are you ready to pray that prayer? God, today is the day that I'm asking you to send me out to do something great. Today is the day that I'm letting go and I'm letting you come into my marriage. Today is the day that I'm letting you take over my finances. Today is the day that I'm letting you take over my life. Wherever you say go, I will go. That's a scary prayer to pray. Many Christians ain't brave enough to pray because they know that they, when they pray it, they're not going to do it. So if you're not going to do it, don't even pray. I'm not even, no, don't even do it. But God, if you're, if you're a Christian, you need to be honoring God and you need to let go and let go. Tonight when we have the uh, 
Uh, <coughs> testimony night for the March going to do it. I believe Ms. Sheila and Ms. Jack. Next week, we've got some other people lined up. We're going to keep doing it. Amen. Are you ashamed of God is my question. Right. If you're not ashamed, well, don't be afraid to get up here. Amen. That's, right. Amen. that's not me putting it on you, but that's Bible. That's, right. that's Bible. Jesus is here. Paul is here. The Apostle Paul, he would say, you need to be up here telling your story. Tell them where you've been. We've got many people in here with different stories and different backgrounds. Amen. And the power of your testimony may bring somebody to Jesus. My sermons, I can preach it, preach it, preach it. Daddy can preach it, but it may be something that you say that brings somebody to Jesus. So don't miss out on an opportunity to give someone else a blessing. Don't miss out on an opportunity to give somebody else hope through your story. If you've been through it, if you've been lost and you've been saved, you've got a testimony. If you've been lost and been found, you've got a testimony. If you've been through things in your life, made mistakes in your life, and you're here today and you're living for God, you got a testimony. But don't come up here. I've seen it many a time. People who are still living in sin, they'll get up here and praise God, but they'll go back to the same sin. If you're living in sin, you've not made a testimony yet. You're back into the world. You've already come forward back to the world. So if you have been transformed with a renewing of your mind, and you're not living the old ways, but you're living the new way for Jesus Christ, you need to get up here and you need to give your testimony. Amen. And I hope that you do. Today, follow Jesus. You've got a purpose in this life, each and every one of you. You've got words. God doesn't care what color your skin is. God doesn't care if you're a man or a woman. God doesn't care what you look like, what your age is. He loves you, and He's got a purpose for you. He's got a will for you, but it's your job to find out. I can't tell you. But you know what? Listen to the listen to other people. I have people come to me sometimes, Brother Zach, God told me to tell you this, and then I'm like, wait a minute, I've been thinking the same thing, and see, He kind of gives us hints and tips on what He wants us to do. But you've got to be living for Him, you've got to be praying to Him, you've got to be close to Him. Cut out the sins in your life and start living for Him. And when we do that as a church, when we come together as a church, we don't have enough seats in this church. When we have a person who don't want to do anything step up and want to start doing something, we will see a difference in the church. But as long as Christians are in the church who don't want to do anything, what do we do? Holding back what God has for us. We've all got to work together. It says that we make up the body of Christ. And the body of Christ don't need no dead weight added to it. We need to be in shape. We need to be prepared. And we need to be ready to run the race. Amen. He'll give us the endurance. He will give us the strength. He will give us the power, Brother Terry. But we've got to be willing to follow Him wherever He calls us to go. I'm going to ask y'all to stand up today. If anybody's lost, I will come down here and I'll pray with you. That's what I'm here for. That's my main thing. Because I want somebody to be saved. If you're a kid right now, you need to be saved. Why are you putting it off? If you've never asked Jesus, Jesus, will you come into my heart? You're lost. Today can be the day that you get saved. Today, Brother Chris, you go ahead and start playing the music. Today can be the day that you can start finding the purpose in your life. But you've got to let go of some things. And you've got to let go and let God work in your life. Do it today. Don't put it off anymore. And let's see great things happen in house of worship. God bless y'all.